All right, welcome back. Here we are. We are in Psalm 64 today, and it is, uh, it's titled in my Bible, A Plea for God's Protection. It says, To the Chief Musician, a Psalm of David. Hear my voice, O God, in my prayer. Preserve my life from fear of the enemy. Hide me from the secret counsel of the wicked, from the insur insurrection of the workers of iniquity, who wet their tongue like a sword and bend their bows to shoot their arrows, even bitter words. They may shoot in secret at the perfect. Suddenly do they shoot at him and fear not. They encourage themselves in an evil matter. They commune of laying snares privily. They say, who shall see them? They search out iniquities. They accomplish a diligent search. Both the inward thought of every one of them and the heart is deep. But God shall shoot at them with an arrow. Suddenly shall they be wounded. So they shall make their own tongue to fall upon themselves. At that see them, all that see them shall flee away. And all men shall fear and shall declare the work of God. For they shall wisely consider of his doing. The righteous shall be glad in the Lord and shall trust in him and all the upright in heart shall glory. So there doesn't appear to be a specific um, circumstance or situation for this particular psalm, um, but it, it appears to be a familiar place for David. We can know that by all the other psalms that we've read and, and understanding of his life and his journey, how he's quite often praying regarding his enemy and protection and deliverance and those kinds of things being falsely accused and, and, and whatnot. And I guess we've, we've seen that throughout our journey in Psalm so far. Now, David begins with not simply a petition for the preservation of his life, but also for the protection from fear. Hear my voice, O God, in my prayer. Preserve my life from fear of the enemy. They, he's not just praying for protection from the enemy. He's, he's praying for a, a protection from the fact that he's going to be afraid. He, he understands the situation he's in. He understands that the things going on around him are out of his control. And the tendency would be to be afraid. And he, he is praying to God right now saying, preserve my life from fear. Now, different difference in saying for fear of the enemy, preserve my life because I'm afraid of the enemy. He's actually praying against just having the fear. I, I don't want the fear. I'm a child of God. I know this. I know the truth. I know who God is. I know his character. And to be afraid is, is kind of in opposition to what I know to be true about God. So David is, the, the word fear here is actually considered the word dread. This is a, a an extreme uh, overwhelming sense of fear that David is praying against. Lord, hear my prayer. Preserve me from fear. Keep me from being afraid. Keep me from being terrified is, is essentially what he's asking. David's plea to God uh, to hear his voice is through meditation. Whether a, a vocal cry or a cry from the heart, God is able to hear. We don't know if he's saying this out loud or simply just a moment of writing. Um, I think it's important actually in a side note to, to kind of do what David does and write out these prayers, write out um, our, our, our needs, our requests, and even put a date on them. You can go back and reference them, go, wow, I remember praying this and I remember how God has answered that. In David's life, he wrote, numerous things and we we have we have those here and it it builds on his confidence in the character of God as he goes through these situations as he recalls the previous instances where God has delivered him he can be confident even more as he goes forward so again this this is a prayer that that really yeah, yes, protect me from my enemies, but also protect me from being afraid of my enemies because he knows that is a relatively natural response. Verse 2 says, Hide me from the secret counsel of the wicked, from the insurrection of the workers of iniquity. It is quite impossible 
to both know and put an end to secret plots done in the dark. If you if you don't know what they're plotting against you because it's done in secret, you really there's not a lot you can do. David really had no choice but to pray. I, I can't I can't get them to stop planning because they're doing it in their minds, they're doing it in their hearts. They're, they're seeking to do something evil, and I can't know it. So the, the only option I have at this point is to pray. Lord, hide me from the secret counsel of, my, of the wicked. So cause me to disappear before their very eyes. So whatever they're coming up with just isn't going to happen. David really had no choice. And he was powerless to do anything else. But David knows, as we should as well, that, that when you pray, you still have more than the enemy. So McLaren wrote, he can but pray, but he can pray. And no man is helpless who can look up. However high and closely engirdling may be the, the wells that men or sorrows build around us, there is always an opening in the dungeon roof through which heaven is visible and prayers can mount. You are never any place that you can't pray. There is always access to God the Father through prayer by the sacrifice of Christ himself on the cross. He has made his presence available. He has made his throne room available for you to come boldly to, to seek what you need, to Request this petition of protect me from fear, protect me from those who try to plan evil against me. Verse 3, who wet their tongue like a sword and bend their bows to shoot their arrows, even bitter words. These secret plots are words and lies against David, not merely just to cause pain, but a plan to end his life. Now verse 4, that they may shoot in secret at the perfect. This word perfect here is, uh, I want to say, is blameless. Okay, so we remember Job being blameless. It doesn't mean sinless. It means nobody can say anything bad about it. So that they may shoot in secret at the blameless. Suddenly do they shoot at him and fear not. So they're not afraid. They're not afraid to spit out lies. And, and we see that all over culture and society right now, especially with this whole midterm stuff going on. People will, will just, just cut to the chase and lie and deceive and speak all kinds of evil, nasty things about their opponent simply to gain control, gain whatever it is they're looking for. And it's not going away anytime soon. Uh, as long as there's going to be people debating or people fighting for the same position, there will be deception and there will be lies and specifically lies being told against those who actually are upright and, you know, are a good choice. The, these attacks from David's enemies being described as arrows imply coming out of nowhere, suddenly with, with pinpoint accuracy. Now, if you're in the midst of a battle, the, the archer is the most feared because he's unseen and and basically a sniper. You don't know where he's going to come from. You don't see him. You don't, you don't hear any click. You could be facing the other direction and would have no idea until you were stuck. So the fear of an archer is, is real because it's an enemy that you can't see. It's an enemy that doesn't let you know you're in trouble. So David describes it in that way because he, he can't see the enemy in his position. These weren't literal arrows, but obviously, but they, they, they attacked him secretly, never attacking face to face. And, and David had little or no way to defend himself. So you can't defend yourself against an arrow you, you don't know that is shot at you, just as you can't defend yourself against what these guys are doing in secret against David. Verse 5, they encourage themselves in an evil matter. They commune of laying of snares privily. They say, who shall see them? To the men David are referring to 
seem to have no fear of God in, in, in any of their ways, planting secret traps unafraid before God and man. It's, who's going to see? We're doing this in secret. We're pulling all the strings. We're doing whatever needs to be done so we can take care of our agenda and, and accomplish what we're said to accomplish. And who's going to know? Who's going to find out? Nobody. Now, but here's what we see. Verse 6, they search out iniquities. They accomplish a diligent search. Both the inward thought of every one of them and the heart is deep. The commentator Trapp said, they search the devil's skull for new inventions, who is ready enough to lend them his seven heads to plot and his ten horns to push at good people. Basically, every thought of them is strictly to accomplish evil upon evil. Again, if, if we meditate for a moment on the status of society at the moment, we know that there are those who their only purpose is to accomplish evil. That's all, that's all they want to do. And they do it in such a way that they look at, they look at the idea of God and go, really, who's going to know how there's no way we'll, we'll make, we we will make it happen. And and nobody's going to know about it. Nobody's going to find out. And we will accomplish what we're set to accomplish. The only problem is, is you can't fight against God. It's not, you can't do it. I don't care how many things you do to accomplish it. God's always going to be on the winning side, period. Verse seven, but God shall shoot at them with an arrow. Suddenly they shall be wounded. So look at this. Those, those, those men, those, those enemies of David who plan in secret, who speak words of, of evil against him and deceit, and they, they commune together laying traps, and they, they pridefully say, who's going to see it? They search out iniquities. They plan. They, their whole goal is to come up with some divisive way to uh, destroy the man of God or the house of God, or the people of God, or the traditions of God, or the, the values of God, or the biblical characters of God. There are those who, who only seek to rip to shreds the very moral compass that God has created. But look what God, but look what David says, God shall shoot at them with an arrow. They're, they're going to be hit and they're not going to know where it came from. It's going to be sudden. It's going to be out of the blue. Hey, they're not going to know who's going to see it. We'll, we'll, we can do this evil in secret and nobody's going to know. Pew, there's an arrow. They're wounded. And they had no idea. This is what David is saying. In this verse, David transitions to a familiar confidence. He's confident in God to handle this. So, Lord, protect me from my fear, because I know that you're going to handle them. It's a confidence in God to protect and to defend. God will step in, and they will be affected. I, I want to add also, it's interesting that, that David says, suddenly they shall be wounded. It doesn't say they'll be destroyed. It says that, that they're going to be wounded in such a way that their lives may be spared, but all of their plans are going to be exposed. Verse 8, so they shall make their own tongue to fall upon themselves. All that see them shall flee away. So the, the, the curtain's been lifted. The, the little man pulling the strings has been exposed. And all the plans have been left out in the open. Everybody knows what it says. And everybody's going to just run away from him. I, man, this sounds like such a good psalm for the moment, psalm for the day. Think of all of the evil that's been planned and, 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 and sought to be accomplished, just being exposed, just being laid out in front of everybody to see. And then they just fall because of their own deceit. 
their own tongue shall fall upon themselves. Basically, it's like they're putting their foot in their mouth or it's, it is, you, you lie so much that you forget what you lied about yesterday. So you, you mess up your story today. And that sounds pretty relevant to, to everything I think we can agree upon. It's, it's this verse that David declares the evil devices of his enemies by God's providence will in fact backfire. And Lord, let it happen. Verse 9, And all men shall fear and shall declare the work of God, for they shall wisely consider of his doing. They, they use their words against David, but God will find a way to turn them for ruin. David here in, in verse 9 speaks of the lessons others will be taught by the way God handles them. Now, again, Scripture is written for our example to where we can we can learn best not to grumble and complain so much. I mean, we know what happened to, to those guys in the Old Testament, for example. So these things that are being seen by by the masses, by, by bystanders, by audiences, by even supporters at the moment. Suddenly they're going to be afraid. They're going to go, whoa, wait, maybe, maybe I shouldn't be on this team anymore. Maybe I shouldn't be over here. And again, the Old Testament is filled with examples for us to learn, you know, what, what kind of effects are going to be because of our choices. Evil begets more evil, but God will avenge his people one way or another. Men will recognize the hand of God, either by his judgment or by his mercy. You know, sometimes those who are, are, are stuck on rebellion, who are stuck on rejecting God, will, have, will see the hand of God at work while, it's, while they're still in rebellion. But again, God's not going to hide himself. God's hand in providential ways is going to be seen both by God's people and by those who reject him. And it will cause fear. And everybody will declare the work of God, whether it be, you know, as a praise or as a mockery. Um, and, and previously the wicked asked who will see them? This was verse 5. Who's going to see us? The answer here is everyone will see because God will use them to teach a lesson to all men. God's going to put on display the wickedness of the wicked as an example, as he always has in, in times past, to say, hey, this is probably a route you shouldn't take. Verse 10, the righteous shall be glad in the Lord and shall trust in him and all the upright in heart shall glory. The righteous will be and quite surely can be always glad in the Lord. As Paul says, rejoice always. Those that trust in him will see his glory for what it is. It's a promise. You and I who've put our trust in Christ will always eventually see the glory of God exposed in one way or another. It will be apparent, it will be amazing. And, and this is the confidence that David has. David has, I will see the glory of God in this situation at some point. And he's, he's stating that the righteous shall be glad. It's a promise, he declares. Those who put their trust in God shall be glad. He's not saying shall have good times. They shall be glad. It's, it's regardless of the situation you're in. We have an opportunity and the ability through our faith in Jesus Christ to be glad, to rejoice, no matter where we're at, no matter what situation we're going in, and, and even so in our suffering. Because we know who God is, we know that we can trust him. We know that he provides for us. We know that he will deliver us from this disastrous temporary life here. And 
we can have confidence in everything he says. And in that, we can be glad and we can trust in him. These, those that trust in him will see, again, the glory for what it truly is. Spurgeon wrote this, Their observation of providence shall increase their faith, since he who fulfills his threatenings will not forget his promises. God always accomplishes what he sets out to do. He always deals with those he says he will deal with. He always handles the situations that he says he will handle. So then, if, if we can be sure that God will judge the wicked, then we can be sure that he will keep his promises to his children. That's, I mean, there's, there's no reason for us to doubt that at all. And our confidence in him should not be affected because we know his character, we know what his word says, we know from history, we know from experience that God is who he says he is. He can be trusted and there is always a reason to rejoice in the Lord. So thank you for watching. Um, like, subscribe, do the Twitter thing, comment, do something, let me know that you're there. Um, you know, if I'm, if I'm talking to myself, hey, that's fine, because I can use this, this encouragement as well. Um, so let's, let's do this together. Let's journey through the Psalms together. Uh, we're, we're, at, we're coming up to 65. We got less than 100 more to go after that. It's going to be a long road. It's going to be a fun road. I look forward to it. Um, stay with me. If you like it, give it to somebody else. If you don't, let me know so I can adjust or do whatever we need to do. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm praying that this is, this is something that's going to benefit you as well as it is me, both now and in the future uh, for various uh, reasons. So um, I'd like to think that God is preparing something, but we shall see what we shall see as one of the Three Stooges said in one of my favorite episodes. So, uh, thank you again. Uh, we will catch you next time in Psalm 65. And God bless.